Okay, thank you. Um, well, we can't have a uh, you know host a, a conference called the Quality Compounding Summit and not talk about testing. So, this is your testing portion of the of the uh, presentations here. Um, titled the titled the chapter minor or the, the my presentation minor chapters. Um, that's probably doing these a, a bit of an injustice. These are important chapters. I called them minor because they're um, lesser known, um, but just because they're they're not as um, you know known and, and understood as some of the other chapters, doesn't make them any less important. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. I have uh, no conflict of interest. This is a educational program. Uh, so whenever we're talking about testing, uh, FDA and USP are always going to come up. So we're going to look at um, you know, come what FDA is up to when it comes to some of these tests, particularly the first two tests that we're going to talk about, and then what resources are available from USP um, to, to help navigate these uh, FDA expectations. So the, the first two tests we're going to look at are microbiology tests on non-sterile products. Um, that's right. So non-sterile products do have microbiology um, test requirements for them. And then we're going to switch gears over to USP 51, which is a um, which is a test to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of, of antimicrobial preservatives that, that can be present in either non-sterile or sterile preparations. So starting with non-sterile, then switching over to a test that applies to both sterile and non-sterile, and then finishing up with uh, container closure integrity testing. Um, which is really a uh, sterile preparation uh, test to be considered. Again, so starting out here with some uh, USP and FDA things. So I think pro probably everyone in, in this conference realizes that uh, compounding is a, is a heavy, heavily regulated um, industry. So there's, there's various, uh, you know, organizations that, um, that are exercising some authority and, and putting, um, laws and rules and standards regulations uh, in place at, uh, in the compounding industry. So hopefully this through this presentation, um, understand a little bit better on, on how to navigate some of the expectations when it comes to these particular tests. As Kim talked about earlier, um, but what she talked about was that the quality assurance and quality um, uh, QAQC from the um, chapters that uh, aren't, aren't official currently, but uh, will be coming. But it, it's important everyone understands that the, the QAQC um, requirements are in the current chapters too. So um, since she went over them in, in great detail, I'm gonna go over them a little quicker, but um, when you think about the quality assurance um, system, so think about the, the, the oversight, right? So that's the, um, that's the staff that's responsible to make sure that all the policies and procedures and things are in place to make sure that um, that uh, that through the, your processes you're you're making uh, quality uh, compound preparations when you think about the QC portion of that think about the QC is, is really the boots on the ground um, so that's the actual uh, sampling you know samples collection for, for testing uh, document you know make sure they receive the test results document the test results um, in, in an ideal situation, the sampling and testing and, and uh, receipt of test results and evaluation of those results would occur prior to the release of a, of a batch of compound preparation. Uh, but certainly I understand that that's not always possible um, due to the nature of compounding. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some other approaches that may, um, may be considered when it comes to testing of, of compound preparations. Okay, so again, the, the QAQC program um, need, need to have a bunch of established SOPs and so standard operating procedures that uh, establish a system uh, to, to make sure that the procedures are followed, um, first of all, right? And then, um, and then the SOPs need to make sure that you can preferably prevent errors, but also have the ability to detect errors when they happen, right? Uh, we're all people, we all make mistakes. So you need to make sure that, uh, that you can uh, detect errors when they do occur. And uh, when errors occur, then you can also end up um, with complaints and adverse events. Th those can occur without, without an error. 
Um, so you need to be able to evaluate those complaints and adverse events. And then also uh, perform investigations and then uh, corrective actions. Kim talked about corrective actions, but also preventative actions, right? So how am I going to correct the error that just occurred, but how do I prevent that error from occurring in the future? All these uh, things need to be documented in SOPs along with um, each person's, each person in the QAQC program's roles, uh, roles and duties. And also that's where you would document um, the training for the staff that have received training. Um, always a good idea to have them date and sign that they received that training and uh, keep that in your, in your records. So uh, responsibilities of Compounder, I think everyone understands Compounder is responsible for making sure that the products are, um, you know, good Compounder preparations. Um, so the, the Compounder really needs to be familiar with 795 for non-sterile preparations and 797 for sterile preparations. But in 795, it also mentions there's a whole host of other USP chapters uh, that the compounder needs to be familiar with. So it says you, you need to know 795 and 797, but you also need to be familiar with some of these other chapters. As Kim mentioned, there's a lot of available resources in USP. Um, and you can, you can dig down some rabbit holes and find uh, you know, a lot of things that you didn't realize were available um, in USP. So we're going to spend some of the time today here looking at the at particularly at, at 1163, which is the quality assurance and, and pharmaceutical compounding chapter that they have. Again, as Brian mentioned earlier, um, chapters above a thousand are informational, um, but uh, just because they're not enforceable and they're informational, uh, doesn't mean there, there isn't some good information in them. Uh, so let's look at, at, at uh, 1163, which has, has a section that's specifically about testing, uh, testing of compound preparations. So, uh, you know, the, the goal of testing is, is always to check the adequacy of the compounding process, but testing is, is a lagging indicator that all the other things that you're doing in your QAQC program are working correctly, right? Don't depend on test results only. Um, it needs to be all the other things that you're doing that, that uh, ultimately should, should lead to, to good test results, right? Um, it's something to take into consideration. I think everybody understands testing finished preparations, but um, there's a lot of intermediates that are used in compounding. So think about your stock solutions and things. Um, testing those should also be something that's considered. Um, if, if you have a stock solution that is made uh, incorrectly, it's going to be very hard to end up with a, a correctly prepared finished preparation. It's basically going to take an error uh, for the finished preparation to be correct if the stock solution or intermediate is, is, is made incorrectly. The chapter also says the compounders need to have a basic understanding of pharmaceutical analysis. So kind of a recent event that happened here, a phone call that I took was that a compounder called in, um, it, their heart was in the right place and they, they wanted to perform some testing on a non-sterile cream, but they called and they asked, if, if, asked for information about performing a sterility test on that non-sterile cream. Um, so we, we could set them on the right direction, but that they didn't understand what tests they were really looking for. We were able to send them in the right direction and get them what they needed. But, uh, you know, so compounders do need to have a basic understanding of, of testing. And, uh, and important here, Kim mentioned it, we're going to see it in some um, FDA stuff that we're going to look at. The acceptance criteria for testing should be determined prior to testing. If the acceptance criteria isn't in place before performing the testing, then it looks like you're really testing into compliance, right? So you have to decide what's a pass and what's a fail uh, prior to the testing being conducted. So 1163 does say, and I mentioned earlier, testing of all compound preparations is not practical or required, right? But you should have, a, have an understanding of, of, of uh, the importance of testing, um, what you're gonna test, when you're going to test, right? So you should think about you know, did, did, did a process change? Is this a new process? Is it a new staff member? Is this new equipment? Right, those are all things that should be considered, should be taken into consideration and determine whether or not testing needs to occur to verify that that, that process, that staff member um, is generating uh, quality compound preparations. Um, so you should also understand again with the, the appropriate test method, like I just said with the, with the non-sterile cream, 
um, and then understand the appropriate equipment for testing. So uh, example of that is, is not all um, compound preparations for potency testing. HPLC is not always the appropriate test method. It often is, but not always, right? So you need to have a little bit of an idea of when an HPLC is appropriate, when it's not, uh, those types of things. And then you need to be able to understand what the results mean and what they don't mean. Um, and then again, what, what actions are you going to take if, uh, if you receive an out-of-spec investigation, uh, out-of-spec specification or test result. So 1163 um, breaks down what, what the test requirements based on whether it's a sterile or non-sterile preparation. We're not going to talk about the first two for the sterile compounders. I think sterility and endotoxin testing is probably fairly well understood. Uh, but we are going to focus on the next three, which again is uh, two microbiology tests on non-sterile preparations, and then USP51, which is um, which is really relevant to um, any preserved products, whether that's sterile or non-sterile. Okay, so looking at some some FDA 483 observations um, for anyone unfamiliar, the FDA 483 is the form that they they provide when they come in and. and uh, and out of the facility and they see something that needs room for improvement. Uh, so we're going to look at some of those and um, of note, all of these 483s that we're going to look at are um, 483s that were issued to 503A facilities. This is all 503As. This is all non-sterile products. Um, so that's one thing I want you to get out of it. The other thing that's important here is that um, FDA inspectors use a variety of language when they're talking about these microbiology tests on non-sterile products. So I'm going to hit on that a little bit, kind of point out what uh, what language they're using, uh, so that uh, maybe you can help interpret the, these uh, these 43 observations. So on this one, these are uh, capsules, and at the bottom portion there of the the, the write up there, it says that the the, the person was issued the citation for not performing a lot of testing. One of the tests that they were not performing was microbial testing, right? So we looked at there was two microbial microbiology tests on non-sterile products. Um, so in this case, the, the term microbial is kind of a generic test. So I think in that case, you can interpret that they were talking about both 61 and 62. We're going to look into some details of those two tests, but um, for, for now, basic, basic idea of the test is that 61 provides you a, a total number of microorganisms that are present in your non-sterile product. And it's, it's, it's a non-sterile product, so it doesn't have to be sterile, but there are limits as to how many uh, my, micro, microbiology organisms can be present. So you think 61, think that one gives me a number uh, as a test result. And then 62 is where you're checking to make sure that um, that of the organisms present, that is not certain types of organisms. So easy example of that is that say in these capsules, um, they don't have, they're non-sterile, so they don't have to be sterile, um, but I don't want E. coli in the capsules, right? Something that can survive uh, through the gastric uh, system and, and cause, cause patient trouble. So, um, so this is 1483 here. So again, this one, this uh, inspector chose to use a, a very general term of microbial testing. So for this uh, 483 to, to 503A pharmacy, the inspector here at the top, they used um, the term free of objectionable microorganisms. So um, objectionable microorganisms, that's referencing USP62, which is, um, have at the bottom of the slide here, designated microbial species. So um, objectionable microorganisms is another term for 62. So that's there at the top. If you look down to the that third portion there of the, four, of the of observation nine, the inspector here used the terms yeast and mold counts. So again, when you see count, think 61. Uh, it's interesting that they put yeast and mold counts because that's only part of 61. Um, 61 actually contains two tests um, and two test results. So we'll look into that. But then the inspector went on to go uh, to, to list uh, specific microorganism uh, like Pseudomonas, but then mentioned uh, also mentioned biotolerant gram negative bacteria, and then also said absence of other 
objectionable microorganisms. So this this 503A pharmacy was, was cited for, for not doing 61 or 62. And these were capsules for inhalation. On this um, 4A3 observation, again, it, uh, they use the term objectionable microorganisms. So that's 62 um, on that one. So on this uh, 483 observation, again, free of uh, objectionable organisms. So that's 62. But then in the second part of this observation, they said that uh, uh, non-sterile products are not tested for the presence of microorganisms. So that's, that's a reference to, to 61, uh, again, which gives you a, a total count of organisms, whereas this objectionable is 62. Um, now this one's a little different. Remember, I mentioned that in 1163, said that prior to testing, you need to have specification set up. So this uh, 503A facility was um, was actually cited for not having appropriate specifications um, in line for their for their uh, microbial limits test. So microbial limits that's another term that can be used for uh, 61. So again, a variety of different languages. We've seen microbial, we've seen yeast and molds, and now we've seen microbial limits. And then on the 62, we've seen specific organisms listed and also the term objectionable organisms. Uh, so here's another one where the, the uh, pharmacy was cited for not having specifications, uh, but this inspector did a very similar thing where they, they mentioned yeast and mold and then also um, listed out some specific organisms and, and used the, um, use the term objectionable microorganisms again. So um, we've seen what the FDA is up to here, um, expectations when it comes to the non-sterile preparations when they show up in your, in your pharmacy. So let's take a little bit closer to look at, at these tests and how these tests are performed. Remember 1163 said that, uh, you know, compounder needs to have a basic understanding. So we're not gonna get into the, Kind of nitty gritty of these tests, but um, are going to talk about the basics of, of them. So again, 60, 61 um, microbial enumeration, um, also referred to as bio burden or microbial limits. Um, and so uh, this test basically it provides you at the, at the end of the test result. Uh, the test result is a total number of microorganisms present. So it gives you a number. It, it actually gives you two numbers. Um, but the, the, the purpose of the test is to determine how many microorganisms are present in a non-sterile product. Okay, so just briefly about how, how the test is performed. Um, the, the test sample is prepared. So whether it's a, a capsule or a cream, you, you can't just you know, kind of take the capsule and sprinkle the contents on top of an auger plate or, or smear some cream on top of an auger plate. The, the test sample has to be prepared. Um, the appropriate preparation steps for that uh, to, to, are, are determined during method suitability. So any uh, sterile compounders are, have become accustomed to that method suitability that's related to the sterility test, um, USP 71, but USP 61 also has method suitability. So, um, so once the test sample is prepared, then the prepared sample then is played on the two different types of media. The reason why it's played on the two different types of media is because one of the media is designed to promote the growth of all anaerobic organisms, whereas the other media is really designed to promote the growth of fungal organisms. Um, they do that, they split it up because um, you know, fungal organisms have a little bit more concern um, due to the nature of, of fungal infections. And so these, uh, the two different Auger plates then are incubated at, at defined temperatures and duration. And at the end of the test, the samples are, the, the number of colonies are, are counted. And then the test results are then uh, back calculated to correct for any dilution of the sample uh, that, that was performed before the, before the inoculation of the medias to come up with the total count of, um, of how many microorganisms are present in the non-sterile compound preparation. So oftentimes the, the results are going to be compared to USP acceptance criteria, right? Remember you gotta, gotta have an, an acceptance criteria in place before you perform the test. That way when you get back a test result, uh, you know, you have 10 to the third 
uh, total aerobic counts and, and 10, 10 to the second uh, fungal counts, you know, is that, is that good, is that bad, right? You need to know um, what those test results mean, how to interpret them. So within 61, there's not any acceptance criteria, but USP does have another chapter, which is 1111, uh, which will provide you some, um, some accept acceptance criteria for USP 61 test results. And, and again, the, the goal of this test is to ensure there's low bio burden in the finished drug product. So looking at uh, 1111 table one, we've split this table up for a little bit um, easier view when it comes to presentation format. So this is just a portion of the table. Going down the left-hand column of the table, they've split the drug, uh, the drug product types into the route of administration. And depending on the route of administration is how you determine what the acceptance criteria is. Again, there's two acceptance criteria here, the total aerobic count and the total yeast and mold count because there's two test results come out of a 61. So again, uh, because of the concern, the higher level of concern with the fungal, um, the fungal organisms being present, the acceptance criteria is, is lower for fungal organisms. So uh, you go to this table, find the right of, right of administration, uh, then look across to uh, um, determine the acceptance criteria. I'm guessing that USP put the um, put the acceptance criteria for 61 in a informational only chapter as opposed to in directly in 61 because they don't want you to just blindly accept those acceptance criteria as being uh, appropriate for, for your finished product. So back in 61, it talks about the acceptance criteria that you really need to take into consideration how the product's used and uh, what the, um, you know, does the product itself support growth, right? Is it, is it an aqueous-based um, cream or is it an oil-based? Is it uh, preserved? Does it have adequate amount of preservative? Uh, so they, they want you to take a lot of things into consideration uh, to determine your acceptance criteria, including uh, taking into consideration that not all patients may uh, be able to handle uh, being exposed to uh, microbial biological organisms the, the same way. So I uh, need to take into consideration the product, the patient, how the product's used when determining your acceptance criteria. So we looked at 61. So again, that, that gives you the total count. Uh, 62, though, looks for specific organisms, right? Use the example earlier that you don't want E. coli in, a, in an oral capsule. Well, you also don't want staph in a, in a, in a topical product. So these, uh, this, the, this test, USB 62, looks um, for specific organisms uh, present in a non-sterile product. So again, the, the test is performed pretty similar to 61. There is, a, there is that method suitability requirement again for 62. So that's where you determine how to prepare the sample appropriately. And at the, at the end of the, at the end of the, at the end of the test, you end up with basically a pass or fail test result. And the pass or fail test result, it, it's a pass if the, if, if nothing grows basically, or a fail if something grows. Although it's, these are microbiology uh, microorganisms, so they're a little trickier than that. Uh, if you ever choose to perform this test and you get a failing test result, you may consider identifying the organism just to make sure that the, uh, the organism that did grow on that media that's designed to only promote the growth of that, that specific organism, um, that, that that is the organism and that is an actual failure. As I mentioned, microorganisms are tricky, so the media are designed to promote only the growth of the organism being tested for, but it's not that cut and dry when it comes to, to, to micro testing. So, um, so if, you, if you get a failing result, don't panic. Um, you know, go ahead and have that, that, that organism identified. Okay. And then so the goal of this test is to make sure that non-sterile dosage forms do not contain specific microorganisms of concern. Remember we saw in the 483 observations, FDA kept using the term objectionable organisms for these, these tests. 
uh, and then back to 1111, this is the other portion of the table that uh, I cut out on the earlier slide. But again, uh, looking down the, the route of administration, based on the route of administration is the um, organ, is what determines what organisms the chapter 1111 recommends are uh, tested for to make sure that those organisms aren't present. Just so when you go look at 1111, you say, well, that's not the table I saw. Here's the table um, in its entirety. Okay, so talked about the 61 and 62, which are two microbiology tests on, on uh, non-sterile products. Now let's switch gears over to 51, which is a test that's appropriate for non-sterile and sterile products, as long as there's a preservative present. So like multi-dose preserved, uh, which applies to a lot of compound preparations. So um, antimicrobial preservatives are, are excipients, again, used in, in both sterile and non-sterile products. And the, these are added to prevent microbial contamination during the use period. So. Uh, think about how some of these preserved products are used. If it's a multi-dose cream or gel that's stored in a tub, a uh, patient goes in, you know, has, has hands that aren't clean, um, and that when they kind of stick their fingers in there to, to, to get out some of the cream, um, there's a potential that they are introducing microorganisms into the, into the product. Uh, think about some of the sterile injectables, the bimix and trimixes and things that, uh, you know, patients are are entering into multiple times, uh, not using aseptic technique, and uh, there's always a potential that microorganisms are getting introduced into that, that sterile preparation uh, during the use period. So that's why ant antimicrobials are, are there um, to prevent the proliferation because there's a likelihood that microorganisms are going to get introduced during the use period. Um, some of the taken into consideration here is that antimicrobial preservatives are not a good substitute. I have good manufacturing practices, but obviously good compounding practices. So don't count on them. That's not a substitute for, for good, good compounding practices. Okay, so this test is a little bit different. It's a, again, microbiology test, but uh, this one's a, a challenge test. So I talked about when the examples that I gave where uh, antimicrobial, excuse me, microbes may be introduced into the uh, compound preparation. Um, and so that's what this, this test basically simulates that, that event. And, uh, and this test is relevant to, to all different kinds of dosage forms. So table that we wrote a couple, or uh, article that we wrote a couple of years ago, this is a table uh, included it in here because I think it uh, can be a valuable resource um, as you're consider, uh, considering what antimicrobial preservative you're going to use. So um, down the left-hand side is a, a list of, of common preservatives. This is just part one of two slides where we're going to have uh, preservatives listed. And, and then what types of uh, formulations they're useful um, in and uh, the concentration range for them to be effective and optimal pH. So got taken into consideration balancing the optimal pH for your antimicrobial preservative along with the optimal pH for the formulation, the API things. And then also have listed here the, the spectrum or what types of organisms that uh, that preservative can be effective against. So here we get into the, to the parabens, uh, commonly used preservatives and compound preparations, chlorobutanol. So in the USP 51, uh, these five organisms listed are purposely introduced into the compound of preparation. And they're introduced into the compound preparation at a, at a pretty high concentration. So they're introduced at a pretty high concentration to simulate a contamination of that, right? So we're simulating when that, when that patient sticks their dirty fingers into their, to their cream or um, you know, when the, when the sterile injectable patient is, is entering the, um, you know, sticking a needle into their, into their sterile preparation um, at home. So during this test, so the, the uh, microorganisms are, are added to the, to the preserved product and they are held for 28 days. So during that 28 day period, 
samples are collected and counts are taken. So it's similar to 61 in that fashion that, that you, you get a count. And so it, uh, you know, during that 28 days, you collect samples at, at seven and 14 and 28 days and, and count them to see how, how are those organisms, are, are they growing? Is my preservative working where it's killing them off? Is it is the preservative working enough where they're not proliferating, or does the um, you know, does the formulation itself not not promote the growth of those organisms? So again, it's a count, and then the acceptance criteria is based on what what type of product it is, or basically what the route of administration is. We'll look at that. So the goal of, of this test is to um, to see if you're if your preservative, antimicrobial preservative, um, is, is effective in um, you know killing microorganisms or preventing their proliferation when added into the preparation, so the um, the categories here really split it. It's split into four categories: and injections being the category one, topicals, then oral products, and then in acids. Uh, we'll look at the acceptance criteria based on the, on the category here. So category one products, which are again, the injectables for bacteria. So you need to have a, a one log reduction from the initial count. So when the, when the lab staff purposely adds the microorganisms into the, into the preserved product to simulate a contamination event, then they have to get a count. So you start off with a certain number of microorganisms that were purposely added and then after seven days, um, pull, some, pull, pull a portion of that, get another count. And at day seven, you need to have a not, not less than one log reduction. So on the bacteria, so that the, the preservative present needs to um, reduce the amount of microorganisms, bacterial microorganisms present by one log count. And then by uh, day 14, there needs to be no less than a three log reduction from that initial, that day zero count. And then at uh, 28 days, you can't have any kind of initial kill off of the bacterial organisms, and then they recover and start proliferating again. So at, uh, at day 28, uh, you can't have any more microorganisms present than, than what were present at day 14. And then for the yeast of molds, which are your fungal organisms, uh, can't have any increase from the initial count at 7, 14, 28. So no requirement here for a reduction, but there is a requirement that they, that they can't proliferate. So that's the category one products, which are the injectables. And then on the category two products, which are the topicals, uh, similar type of thing, but a, a little bit different acceptance criteria. So in this case, uh, 14 days after that initial addition of all those microorganisms, you have to have not less than a two log reduction after 14 days of incubation. Um, and then again, you can't have by 28 days, you can't see any more proliferation happening. And so you can't have any more, um, no increase in the bacterial counts from day 14 to day 28. And then the same acceptance criteria here for the fungal organisms where there's no increase, uh, from 14 or 28 days, they, they don't have a day seven account, uh, account there. Um, and then, so you get the idea based on the uh, route of administration, uh, chapter 51 puts them in, in four categories and then the four categories have their own acceptance criteria. So here the acceptance criteria is within the, is within the USP primary chapter. Okay, so switching gears now to um, container closure integrity testing. This is really a um, sterile product test uh, that should be considered. Um, so back on FDA, so FDA back in February of 2008, they put out this guidance for, for industry where it basically says that container closure integrity testing is a better test to be performed as part of a stability study. It's, it's better than doing sterility over time when it comes to a stability study. This guidance docket, what it, the reasoning it, it provides for saying that container closure integrity testing is better than sterility testing is it cites weaknesses of the sterility test. 
says that the sterility test weakness is that you don't test the entire batch. Right? If you tested the entire batch, you wouldn't have any um, anything left for other tests like you know potency or pH variance, you know those things. Um, and so it says so basically it's, sterility is important to make sure that you produce a sterile product. But when it comes to stability, what you're really assessing then is can that container closure system maintain a sterile environment? And it's and it says that in, in, when you're you know kind of testing the, the container closure system and see if it can maintain the sterile environment, the best way to do that is to challenge the container closure system itself. Okay, so we're going to look into uh, in, into this chapter a little bit. So. Uh, it, it's important that your package doesn't leak uh, so that A, you can preserve sterility. Um, B, you don't want to have formulation loss. So think about a sterile injectable that's preserved with a benzyl alcohol. If there's a, a, an opportunity for that benzyl alcohol to escape, uh, then you, you no longer, um, you risk no longer having a preserved preparation. Also, if some of the um, aqueous uh, parts of the of the drug product are leaking out, then you could end up with a situation that uh, um, where you have, you now have a super potent drug product, right? Uh, probably less common for for compounders, although I think there's a few that do it, where you um, basically fill the top of the uh, top of the vial with uh, nitrogen to prevent the drug product from being exposed to oxygen. Uh, you certainly don't want that to escape either. It's, it's added there for a purpose. Um, point being here is that to, when you think about the container closure test, integrity test, um, under, understand that these tests challenge the entire system. So uh, when you're talking about a vial, so it's, it's not just challenging the vial, it's the vial with the rubber stopper, with the aluminum uh, sealer on the outside, it, it challenges the entire system. Uh, there's different tests that are required or um, for testing empty vials themselves. Those in most cases are probably done by the manufacturers, but uh, these tests challenge the entire system. So uh, when you think about a, an IV bag, these container closure integrity tests, they're not just challenging the, the ports, they're challenging the entire bag, right? So when you think about a container closure system, think about the entire system. Um, so different types of leaks and, and the concern, obviously, if, if things can leak out, there's concern that the um, that microorganisms could potentially leak in, right? So now you've got a, a sterility contamination event concern. Um, again, with the product leaking out, um, product leaking out or, or maybe a preservative evaporating or something, then the concern is that now you've lost a, a a critical quality attribute for the phys physical chemical side. Um, and then again, we talked about the, the headspace and that those are um, those inert gases uh, are added for a reason. So loss of them would, could be detrimental to the uh, stability of the product. Okay, so um, on this one, these, these new tests that we're going to talk about um, are considerably more sensitive then the, the, the kind of older tests that people may be um, more familiar with, like a, like a dye ingress test. Um, so in the, in the past, the main concern was really about microbial contamination. Um, you know, we just looked at, at some of the other concerns. So these, these newer test methods are, are a lot more sensitive than those, those, those older tests. And so USP does allow for um, a, a leakage limit um, you know, there's, there's an acceptance criteria. So if you perform this testing and you get some, uh, some leaks are detected, then, um, um, you know, you should go to, go to chapter 1207 and, uh, and, and look at the allowable leakage limit there. Uh, cause again, some leakage may not actually be a, a failing result. Okay. So 1207 splits the uh, lists a variety of types of tests and it splits them into two categories. The first category they call deterministic methods. So these test methods are quantitative and, uh, and, and give definitive test results, meaning it's not really uh, up to uh, interpretation by an analyst. So 
Um, you know, when we're seeing things like a, like a laser being involved in a, in a uh, container closure integrity test or, you know, looking for de decay of certain types, of pressure or vacuum there. Um, they understand th these are complicated tasks that are very sensitive and capable of uh, detecting very small leaks. Whereas some of these other tests that people may be familiar with, like a microbial challenge by immersion, which is basically where you take the entire container closure system and submerge it into a, a microbial bath or microbial soup, if you will, um, and, and, and see if the microbes enter the inside or with the, the dye ingress test where the container closure system is, is submerged in a dye, pull a vacuum. The theory, the theory behind the test is when you're pulling the vacuum, if there's any leak, you're going to create a vacuum inside the container closure system. Once you kill the vacuum and the system stabilizes, that uh, dye will leak in through the, um, through the, through the same port where the, um, where the air leaked out and created that pressure differential and, and the dye would come in. The, the problem is, is that the dye molecules are significantly bigger than, um, than, than the, the hole would be required to get dye in would be larger than, than the hole that would be required to get air to leak out. So, um, so these they call probabilistic, um, so they're, they're qualitative and they, they use human judgment. So obviously they prefer the, the, the prior test methods as opposed to uh, these te test methods that would be less sensitive. Um, so again, here, um, you know, there, there is an allowable limit. Just keep in mind that the, the, the larger the leak, the larger the concern. Um, and if you're using one of these new t test method types, they're going to be sensitive or they are very sensitive. Uh, and there's a chance, there's, there's a chance that, that the leaks found um, again, can reference back to 1207 if uh, if a leak's detected, and figure out what if you're still within the limits of the of the test. So, looking at one of those um, sensitive test methods, uh, particularly the vacuum decay method, uh, this is a test where the the entire packaging system, the entire container closure uh, system, is placed inside a test chamber. That test chamber needs to be uh, fairly snug. There can't be a bunch of excess air space in there. So, um, so the more open space there would be inside the test chamber, the less sensitive the test would be uh, moving to these more sensitive tests for a reason. So having a big uh, kind of open space in there where you're pulling a vacuum um, ruins the sensitivity of the test. And, and so uh, don't be surprised if you contact a laboratory about it, but they um, talk, talk to you about a, ch a chamber that may be required. So the idea behind the test is that then this the container closure system was placed inside a chamber that's, that's very tight fitting, not a bunch of open space. Uh, the, the machine would pull a, a vacuum on that test chamber and uh, get to a point where the vacuum stabilizes. And then the test would monitor for any changes in the vacuum level over time. So it's measured by the instrument. Uh, idea being that uh, if the package is defective, that as air leaks out or drug product leaks out or if vapors of any kind of leak out, that it's going to change the pressure, the vacuum pressure inside the, inside the chamber. And, um, <clears throat> and that would be detected by the instrument. And so um, that would yield, yield a, a failing test result. And, uh, if the container closure system is, is intact and does not leak, then that vacuum level, um, once it stabilizes by the, by the instrument, uh, would, would hold at a constant level. Okay. And so the, the goal of the uh, container closure integrity testing is to make sure that the container closure system can maintain the sterile environment um, that, that the product was made in over the course of the, um, the in use period or, or shelf life or BUD. Right? Uh, so, in summary, um, you know, non sterile products do have test microbiology test uh, um, requirements. Um, USP 61, which provides a total count, and USP 62, which looks at specific organisms. There's that 51. Um, Got to take into consideration for the sterile compounders. Say you're starting with a sterile preserved product, 
but you're performing some sort of dilution of it. So say you're taking a 10 mil vial and you're adding the contents of the 10 mil vial into a 100 mil IV bag. Well, you just diluted that um, antimicrobial preservative in the commercial product by like one, you know, one to 10. Um, and so that, that final product in the IV bag, once the dilution of the commercial product is, 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 has uh, been performed, that that antimicrobial preservative is probably not at a concentration in which it, it can uh, react uh, appropriately if a contamination event occurs. Uh, same thing with the preserved creams that people are using. If you add, if you do a bunch of manipulations to that cream or add a bunch of APIs and things, you are uh, diluting out that preservative concentration. And it may be to the point where the, uh, the antimicrobial preservative is no longer effective at uh, combating any um, contamination events. So um, things to take into consideration uh, when you're compounding uh, multi-dose products. And then we looked at, um, at 1207, which is um, uh, container closure integrity test and why FDA believes that that test is a better test when it comes to a BUD study of a, a sterile preparation. A um, lot, of, lot of chapters referenced there. So I've got those uh, listed here along with um, you know, references to the, to the tables that I provided with the preservatives and then that FDA guidance doc. Okay, thank you. I think we should have some time for some questions here. Did we, did we get any questions, Trevor? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Kelly. Linda McElhaney asks, wouldn't capsules for inhalation have to be sterile or free from organisms? I thought any inhalation would need to be sterile. Let's see. Referencing my, that's a good question. So I got a table over here that I keep on my wall um, from a USP chapter and it actually does have, uh, the inhalations do have to be um, uh, sterile. So, um, maybe that's something worth the FDA inspector um, and miss the boat on that one. Great question. James Axtell asks, I'm testing NS compounds, but is it required in 61? They usually grow something and we identify 62. Is it required? So, um, so again, I guess it depends on your definition of required. I, I don't believe that uh, USP 795 says that 61 is a requirement. Um, but again, that's that's something that needs to be defined when you're setting up your SOPs in your um, you know, your, your uh, quality SOPs and defining when you're going to test. That's great if you can test every compound of preparation. Uh, if you cannot, you sh your SOP should define when you're going to test and should take into things to, into consideration like did, did something change, right? And that would be where you would perform another another testing event. Um, you're right. So it's a, it's a non-sterile preparation. So, um, yeah, something, something's going to grow, um, as long as the test is performed correctly, right? Um, mostly as long as that method suitability was performed correctly to figure out how to prepare the sample and perform the test correctly. Um, so that was, uh, again, the 61 part. Trevor, can you repeat the, the, the question again? Make sure I hit on all of it. Oh, uh, yes, sir. I'm testing NS compounds, but is it required in 61? They usually grow something and we identify 62. Is it required? Okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, 61 is a chapter about testing non-sterile products. I didn't mention it during the presentation, but uh, 61 is also a test that can be used on testing an, uh, an in-process sample on a sterile preparation too. On 62, again, that chapter is is for testing non-sterile preparations. Um, and you mentioned identification. Identification is always a good idea because microorganisms can be tricky. And so um, just because the test is designed to only promote the growth of, of say staff, uh, doesn't mean that only staff is gonna grow on it. So um, identifying that contaminating organism is a good idea because it can make the difference between a passing and a failing test result. 
Linda McElhaney asks, would you just test items that are being batch prepared? I can't see that a compounder would test a patient-specific compound unless there has been a problem. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, and as uh, 1163 mentions, the testing every non every compound preparation is really not practical. Uh, so as opposed to testing after there's a problem detected, I would recommend testing before. So again, so uh, qualifying your staff, qualifying your processes, which includes cleaning, qualifying new instruments um, and things, you know, qualifying your processes before you're producing drug products using them, ideally, um, to make sure that, uh, yeah, the, the staff is acting appropriately, your cleanings are acting appropriately, environment is under control, you know, all those types of things. And if you're doing those and have those defined and you're performing those testings, which should all be written down when you're doing them, why you're doing them, et cetera, um, then testing every compound preparation for a 503A said Linda, that's not practical. Um, but the idea should be to try to prevent things and you prevent, you know, prevent uh, poor events or, or problems by qualifying your processes in advance. Um, yeah, I think that answers that one. Next question, Trevor. Eric Mays asks, what if you have a manufacturer switch on your sterile vial? Does that invalidate your study? It can be hard to stay with one supplier 100% of the time with regards to CCI tests. Yeah, no, un understood, Eric. Um, it, it's also when you switch the supplier for an API or supplier for a, a base cream or something. Um, so it, with testing, there's always the balance between um, you know, costs and risks, right? Um, so you can do a risk-based assessment and determine whether or not uh, you think that's problematic. Um, but again, so you, you do the analysis, you justify why you're not testing or you do the testing. Uh, so you really determine uh, which route you wanna take there and what, what's more important to you. Would you rather be able to, you know, in case of, a, of an audit, um, and, and an inspector asks you, why didn't you perform the testing? Uh, you either provide them the documentation of what your justification was for why I didn't perform the testing, or you provide them a test result, right? So, um, you know, something to be taken into consideration, just as all, um, you know, all compounding pharmacies are created equal, neither are all biomanufacturers and there can be problems um, at, at times. And so, um, yeah, I guess it depends on your, your level of trust in your, in your um, provider there. Uh, but again, the, the safest bet is always to test, but that, you know, I understand there's a cost associated with that and, and time delays and things. So um, it's really a balance there between, um, you know, what you think is appropriate and what, what you can justify, what you want to justify versus, um, you know, do, do you want to just perform the test? All right, we have one from Kyle Sullivan. He asks, I see that USP61 has been mentioned in FDA 483s, but is it really required for non-sterile compounding? How are these applied to all non-sterile products that a compounding pharmacy produces? Yeah, so I mean, I think you see FDA expectations, Kim's, Kim's entire talk was about how to sort of incorporate some of the ideas from a 503B pharmacy into a 503A pharmacy. Um, we, we've seen before that some of the things trickle down from 503B into 503A space. So I can tell you a lot of the 503Bs are testing every non-sterile product. Um, I realize their batch sizes are significantly larger and that allows them to do it. They're batching things up. Um, they can store product. Um, so you're, you're right. So 61 is, has been mentioned in FDA 483s. So uh, I guess it depends on what your inspector is. But again, I, I would take into consideration, um, you know, we kind of like to say the, the man machine method. Um, if you have some test, test results that you can show them where I validated my process, all of my processes for non-sterile products, um, you know, so taking into consideration that a that a cream is made differently than a capsule, which is made differently than, than um, you, you know, than a, than a tablet. So those are all different processes, all likely performed by, um, you know, potentially by different staff using different equipment and things. 
So in the case of an FDA inspection, you know, a lot of us get 483s as a result of those inspections, but if you can show them that you, you've got an SOP written down, you followed it, I qualified each technician with each process that they do using each piece of equipment and things, um, and then um, you know at least you'd have something to provide to them to show that you have taken those things into consideration. You do have data to support that, uh, that you are generating uh, quality compound preparations no, I'm not testing every batch. That's really hard for, for a 503A uh, pharmacy, but at least you, you have some coverage there. We have another question. Would you do the USP51 testing to test your formula once? How expensive is it? Yeah, so um, yeah, good question. So 51 really is uh, considered part of formulation development. It's certainly not a um, batch release type test. So, but it is microbiological in nature. So when it comes to microbiology tests, uh, replicates are always nice to have. Um, but, um, you know, the, the 51 should be performed at, at least one time. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, per formulation. And um, it doesn't necessarily need to be performed as part of batch release. If you are wanting to do something on a batch release, you could always consider just doing a potency test on the preservative instead. Um, as I mentioned, when I was talking about how the test is performed, it's fairly involved. It's a lengthy test. I, I have it down there, it's 28 days. Well, 28 days is really the storage period, but I talked about how during the course of the store, uh, that storage period, you're collecting samples and planting them, allowing them to grow. Uh, so the test is actually 28 days plus an additional seven days. Uh, so it's like, it's a 35 day test where you're doing counts all throughout. So it's a fairly involved test, uh, fairly, fairly expensive test. Uh, for us, it's, uh, it's $500 for the method suitability and a thousand dollars for the, for the test itself. But again, that's a one-time per formulation test. All right, I think we can fit in one more question. Do I need to test the preservative potency first? Yeah, so that's a good idea. Um, again, kind of similar answer to the question I, I asked earlier, or answered earlier. Um, it's always the balance between performing the testing, which is an additional cost, and worrying about um, you know what you can justify or what you can't. Kim mentioned earlier, don't, don't tell me, show me, right? So if you claim that you have 0.9% benzyl alcohol, some inspector in a bad mood or one that was just trying to be difficult could say, well, how do I know that you, that you actually have 0.9% benzyl alcohol in there and that you didn't purposely put you know, double the amount in the, in the formulated product that you made just for the 51, just so you pass the 51 test, right? So to avoid that question, you could consider doing the potency on the preservative at the same time that you initiate the 51 test or, or before, um, you know, to, to prove that you do have the labeled claim amount of preservative in there and that that amount of preservative then passes the 51 test. That buttons everything up. Um, you know, you probably have an inspector that'd be fairly difficult, uh, that was being fairly difficult to ask that question, but um, you know, to, to avoid have, having to get in that, that discussion, you could consider running a preservative potency test. And again, the preservative potency test is a, is a good test to consider on, uh, for batch release on sterile preparation, uh, excuse me, on, on preserved preparations. Okay. 